us this morning. We've gathered so we could, the Haiti group could share with you our experiences when we traveled to Haiti. From April 2nd to April 9th, 16 members of our school community, actually 15 members of the school community made the whole trip, went to Haiti <laughs> to build a house and to work with Be Like Brit Home for Children. Some of the children that, that lived in the Be Like Brit Home had lost their parents in an earthquake near Port-au-Prince in 2010. The earthquake is significant because it also took the life of Brittany Gengel. She was a 20-year-old college student who, had, who was from Rutland, Massachusetts, who went to Haiti for the same reasons that we did, to help people in Haiti and to learn about their culture. As you will hear from your peers up here, the service trip had great impact on their lives. We thank you for attending this morning so that we can share with you our experiences. Please know that we could not have made this trip without your support. We love the letters that you wrote us, the generous gifts, the donations, and the attendance at our fundraising events and our other events. We thank you. Again, we couldn't have done it without you, not just your financial support, but your spiritual support. To give a little context, if you take a look up here on the map, Haiti is a small island in the Caribbean. A little bit east of Jamaica, southeast of Cuba. Takes about six to eight hours traveling by plane to get there. It's on a tectonic plate, on the, core, on, on the edge of a tectonic plate, and it's susceptible to, to earthquakes. So at this time, I'll have Ms. Ms. Crozier come up and, and speak a little bit about what Be Like Brit is and the impact that Be Like Brit is having in Grand Bois. So as Dr. Lozat mentioned, Brittany Gangle was a local college student who passed away during the earthquake. Her last message to her parents was this text that's up on this wall. So she said, they love us so much. So her last text message sent to her parents was this. They love us so much, everyone is so happy. They love what they own, what they have, and what they work so hard to get nowhere. They are all so appreciative. I watched him move here and start an orphanage myself. So Brittany was down doing a college service trip over her um, winter break when this occurred, and she sent this text message, and a few hours later, perished in the earthquake. She was missing in the rubble for 33 days, which is significant because that is the number of children in the orphanage. So they have 33 boys and 33 girls, specifically because that's the number of days she was missing. So Len and Cheryl and her parents work very hard to maintain this orphanage. Um, they have basically now dedicated their entire life to building and helping all these kids out in the local community in the area. So they house the kids, and within the orphanage itself, they have tons of employees. They're the biggest employer in Grand Bois, so they have over 200 employees currently, and they're all working on a nonprofit basis, so every donation goes to help pay for the children and the employees. So, what I'm going to do now is have the kids kind of talk about their experiences. They picked some major topics and themes that mean the most to them, and you guys can feel free to ask questions at the end, okay? Um, I'm Morgan. 
Jason. I'm Matt. I'm Elizabeth. I'm Hannah. I'm Katie. I'm Dan. I'm Matt. I'm Riley. I'm Sarah. I'm Nicole. I'm Everett. So the first thing that guys are going to talk about is daily life as a missionary is what they call you when you're servicing the orphanage and being with the organization down there. So every morning we would wake up around 7 and we had to be out of the house by 8. So we had to shower by then, eat. We had bagels every single day, so there really wasn't a choice. And then brushed up. Right to your mouth. Right. Um, right. So there wasn't really a choice of what we got to have for breakfast. So it was bagels all day long with peanut butter and Nutella, basically. So we had that seven days out of the week. Just a little bit of information about the compound itself. You can see it's shaped in the letter B. Um, that's, you know, Brittany's first name, so they decided that's why it's B. And um, on top, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a black tank, and that's where they store rainwater that they acquire, and they actually give a thousand gallons every day to the community around them. Just a little information about the place. Um, so after we'd eat breakfast, we would go to the work site where we were building the house, and we would spend um, from 8 to 12 there, and just like doing whatever task they had for us that day. Um, some of them were harder than others, but it, was, it wasn't like the whole day we were working, it was just the morning. Uh, these are the buses that we took, so uh, they have a lot of trouble with their transportation, Haiti, because most of their cars are from America that are kind of older, so sometimes they don't really work. So some of our days, the cars broke down, we had to switch cars a lot, and every day it was 100 degrees, so it was kind of difficult for us to be able to get used to that. Um, after the work site, we came back, had lunch, and then we'd go on, we went on an excursion every day, and they were different. Um, we went to a Cuban clinic to see what like third world mess was like when. Okay. <laughs> uh, so every day we would have lunch and dinner and breakfast in this area. And so we would talk about like We like look at the view and <laughs> and um, just like talk about what we're either gonna do today or what we have done that day. So this was the Britishness area where no one else could be. The kids couldn't come up here. So this is our time alone from them because we couldn't get too close to them. So it would be like emotional breakup, like when we leave. So we'd have to take a break and not hang out with them all the time, so that's where we would go to talk about what we did and how like how hard the day hit us because we built a house for people that didn't have homes and it was hard work. And it even gets me emotional to talk about it. But it was a really, and that dude's the best right there with the hat on, his name's Frankie. <laughs> he gave me a haircut, it was kind of cool. So, yeah, we'd, get, we'd build these homes and we'd start with nothing, they had nothing there every morning. So the first day was concrete day and me and Dr. Lazad just went hard going to concrete, like just shoveling it. And then all these people had buckets carrying it through like hundreds of free weather to build people homes. So it was just awesome. Um, so um, after
and they always had something fun for us to do at the end of the day. And um, and as missionaries, we were really spoiled. Like Len is in charge of the um, missionary experience, and he it's really important to him that we're comfortable. So they do. Um, like we have air conditioners, we have a refrigerator, we have obviously we have clean water, so we're really spoiled when we're down there. And it was very important to them. Um, every lunch and dinner, we had to say a prayer before we were allowed to get up and get food. And then we had to sit down with our food and wait for everyone else to be able to sit down before we could eat. Because they're, we didn't, but we are supposed to. Um, because they're very religious there, and it's just like the respectful thing to do. Um, the English classes were really cool. It's not like Spanish or French class here. You walk in, like all the kids are speaking English perfectly. Like. There's eight-year-olds that can speak English pretty fluently, and it's really cool because they want you there. Like, you walk in, they start screaming and jumping around and dancing, and then you have to get up in front of the class, and they try to talk to you, which is just really cool. It's not like any of our foreign language classes here. It's funny because, like I said, I didn't like school, and they were all, like, making fun of me. Like, if you don't like school, like, and they are just like, it was just funny because they were making fun of me because I didn't really, like, personally like school. They are like, why don't you like school? I was like, and then there's a uh, made fun of me in Korea, so I couldn't understand it. <laughs> so I don't know this. Uh, and now we're on to building the house. I feel like I'm eating it though. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing this while it's at least. Look at that. I'm sweating. Like it's a hundred degrees at least. <laughs> So is everyone. We had to roll up our sleeves. It was like unbelievably hot. As soon as you woke up, you're sweating, and there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, so the first, like, we were really, like, we definitely could not build a house. Like, I, I know, I have no idea what I was doing, but like, we had these really awesome um, Haitian workers that worked with me, like, right, who like kind of taught us. So. They, um, like, kind of taught us how to do everything. I know, like, the first day, like, the hardest thing was hammering. Like, it sounds like the easiest, but it was the hardest thing. And, like, it took so much patience. What? It took so much patience. And, like, it was just the worst job ever. And, like, they always taught us and pretty much did it for us. So. And also, it was hard because, like, the material we were using wasn't, like, the best with the nails. So as soon as you hit it, it would bend. And then... You'd have to try to strain it because you have to use everything possible. Like, you can't really waste anything there. So, like, if you screw up, like, it means a lot for you to screw up. Like, everything is needed. So, like, you can't really make too, too many mistakes. So, this is the bed we made for the family after on the last day. So, this was kind of like the last piece of work we did right there for the family. So, we put the bed together. We made two of them. And usually people only make one house homes, we made two room homes. So it was really a big deal for this family because this family in particular didn't live together at all. Like they would live in different people's houses. And she had a, she worked for the Be Like Career family, so she'd been waiting for a house for a while. So her, like we met her bro the brother of this family. And like he was so nice, he helped us, and he didn't even have to. He could have done other things, but he wanted to stay and help us in the 100 degree weather instead of hanging out with his friends or something like that. So it meant a lot because he showed that like how grateful he was and how grateful the family was. I agree with Jason. Um, even the mother showed up once, and that's what I'm saying though, know, because when she must have been 60 something, maybe. Perhaps. And you know, she was she just she just came in there with uh, you know buckets and buckets of soil just you know, in a few days, and she just, you know, intermittently come in and help, I think. She didn't want to feel guilty or anything of that sort. Um, they seem they're very humble people. Um, at the work site, we would meet, um, like, little, like, the kids that lived in that area where we were building the house. So we were, like, kind of right in the center of town, and it was, like, a super busy area, so there was, like, always people coming in and out, like, to see what we were doing. And, um, Megan and Jen would always say to us, like, the reason that so many people would come and watch was because, like, they didn't really have any other entertainment, and, like, they didn't, a lot of those kids don't go to school, they don't really do anything throughout the day, so, like, watching us build the house was, like, entertainment for them, and, um, I know that, like, I had a 
good relationship with the kids that were at the work site, even though, like, there was a language barrier. It never really felt like there was. It was just, like, just nice to be, like, in their presence, I guess. And um, I think, like, that was, yeah, I think that was, like, probably one of the most um, important parts for me was, like, having a relationship with those kids. Um, okay, so Elizabeth said that hammering day was the hardest for her. But I think that for some others it was concrete day because we literally just had to shovel buckets of concrete. They were pretty heavy for four hours in the really hot sun. Um, yeah, I got, we all got some cuts and bruises. And, <laughs> and like we really, yeah, we really slowed the workers down too. So it was just really good for them to be able to help us even though. They, were, like, they could have built the house in a day by themselves. So it was great for you all, but really, really quickly. <laughs> um, like Elizabeth said, the kids at the work site were my favorite part. Um, it's hard, hardest leaving them because you don't know like what they have. You don't know if they have clean water. You don't know if they have food, even. Um, there is one girl, Sheena, I don't know if she's going to be in any of these pictures. She probably will. She's like eight years old, and she's the cutest thing you'll ever see. Like. All these kids, even though they have nothing, they're always smiling. They're always happy. Um, they loved us. Even though they were a little shy at first, like within the day, they were jumping on us as soon as we came in. Yeah, like an hour, not even. Um, and then like the last day, like, it's kind of hard with them because they don't really know English as well, even though the older boy did. The son, no, not the boy. The guy who was helping us build his house. Yeah, he knew English pretty well. But like the little girls, they don't know, and they don't go to school. So they were just sitting there all day with us. And then like when I left, I didn't know they knew my name, I didn't know anything, but she was like, Katie, don't leave. And then she was telling me and Jason to like take her with her. And that was really hard. Just to like inform you guys, so like the first three days, like we were all shoveling concrete, so like that was the first three days. And then the fourth day we put up the walls, and the fifth day we painted, and then the sixth day we made the beds and then a hurricane proof the house. So just in case a hurricane came or something like that, it wouldn't break or anything like that. On them. So that was how our schedule went for this. And then the seventh day we blessed the house with giving them the go and all the food and all the supplies they have. Talk about go. Because the go was like kind of like a bank account for them in a weird way, if that makes sense to you guys. Like, so if anything happened, they could sell their go and then get something for it. So, and also they can make milk, they can kill, like kill it and eat it. And the go we gave them was pregnant, so it could have babies and they could, yeah, have many goats basically. So that was kind. Of, that picture is kind of like how it happened. So I would shove me in, someone would shove the buckets, and then we transfer it to that like uh, foundation right there, put the concrete in there. Carry it. Yeah. Carry it, yeah, somewhat of a distance because where we had the concrete, there was, there was a house and it was kind of far. So we had to walk through a path and then there was a street right there, the main street that was kind of dangerous because like, the yeah, the, like the cars were crazy. Like they didn't, they didn't know like anything. They would drive through any distance. And, like the motorcycles drove on the side of the road. Like it was crazy. So it was dangerous to be that close. So like when I'd get too close, like the workers would be like, back up, back up, like anything could happen. So it was kind of a distance we had to carry the material to get to the foundation. So it was kind of laborious. And this was actually the first day when we were doing the hammers. Yeah, we did hammers all week, but that was our first time with them. So we weren't the best at first. Well, we got our way there. So that, go back one. So that was the bus we basically took every single day. And that was our driver. And we had to carry, so there was a lot of use for water. So we had to use the water to mix the concrete. We had to use the water. <coughs> what else we had to use water for? Oh yeah, just that, never mind. <laughs> And drinking. And the thing was, it was weird to drink water because, like, all these people around you didn't have water, so you felt bad when you had to take a drink of water, and like, or you had to take a snack break or anything like that. Like, I didn't take any eat any snacks. Like, 
at the end of the day, I'll give my snacks to people around me because I knew what I got back, I was going to eat. I knew they weren't going to eat, so I would give my food and give my water to these people. And most of everyone else here, they gave away all their stuff as well because they knew. We all knew they didn't have anything. Um, sorry, just not think about like the water. When like when we gave it to them, instead of one kid, like they were like four to eight years old or whatever, instead of just drinking all the water for themselves, they made sure they only took a couple sips of it and then shared it with their siblings. And then we just go back and fill it more, and they just kept sharing it instead of being greedy, which is really cool since they don't get that every day. And um, I would just like to talk about Frankie for a second, Frankie and Madonna, because, like, they were awesome. And, um, like, we, it's super important that we talk about the kids at the Lake Grove, but um, the staff are just as important. And they, like, are all amazing people. They are, like, so excited to learn English and to, like, learn from us when we go see them. And um, I know that, like, for me, Frankie and Madonna, like, I'm never going to forget them. And, um, like, they were just, like, the life of the party and like they were friends with all of us like they never made us feel excluded they always made sure we were safe and um Biju, like he always had our back too <laughs> um so yeah so that, that was Alexander and I have been really close with him so it was hard to um, be separated from him so I hope he's doing fine but at this orphanage everyone is doing fine the kids are really blessed have a meal every day. Because outside the walls, people have nothing, so like they know that, so they're just grateful for anything they get. And we actually, while we were there, we had someone had their birthday. I forgot her name, sadly. But Mary Casson. And she had an infection in her eye. That was really sad. So like she had to wear glasses on her birthday because like she couldn't even like see out of her eyes. So. It was really sad. <laughs> they all had the eye infection, and they would like come up to us and like open their eye and be like, "Look, look!" And it was disgusting. <laughs> A little bit about the, the, the kids from the orphanage. There's 66 kids that live in that building. Some of them came from Port-au-Prince after after the earthquake, who had lost their parents. But some of the other kids came from I was what they call the mountains. Haiti is very mountainous, and the road, main road that Jason and everyone was talking about is the only main road on the island, and it's on a coastal plain. So to get to the interior of the, the mountains, you have to, as you will see in some of the pictures, you have to climb through these areas. And when they were building the orphanage, uh, Lennon and, and Cheryl, people would bring their children or a child to them. And this child had experienced either something very traumatic medically or mentally. And that they and they would just accept them in. And most of the time that these children were from miles and miles and miles inland, where there's no roads and very little services and very little resources to, to, to live. So some of these kids that you're seeing, the pictures of, they're smiling but they've gone through a lot of trauma in their lives. So the, the idea that you make these connections with them, of course, they, they love the, the, the affection. And as, as I'm seeing from the pictures and the time that I was there, uh, the, the students here really connected very well with them. And you can see how it brought a lot of joy to these children's lives that didn't have, that had a very difficult life before they were in, in, the, in the home. So like, think about this, like, these are the worst case, like, scenarios that they came from. So like, a lot of people look rough outside the walls, but we accepted them because they, the brief, like, Brit people accepted them because they probably had the worst, out of the worst, basically, because they're already, everyone outside the walls is already broke and have no money and don't have any food. So what happened to them, I can only imagine, they wouldn't even allow them to tell us. And they're still so happy at the end of the day, like, as soon as we came there, we were accepted with open arms. They were already hugging us. They were already like wanting to play soccer. They were, they were just so like unbelievably happy, even though they don't have like the stuff we have, like phones. They don't have anything like that, and they're just happy. And it was just really like a shock, a shock to me. And like, look at that. The cart doesn't even have two like the four wheels on it. Only has two, and we are still playing with it, and they're still having a fun time. You know what I mean? So like. Sarah to push it on the ground. <laughs> <laughs>
and so it's like the um, community is kind of divided between those two, but like every person believes in voodoo. So it's like, um, it's a really important factor for them. So this was on Mission of Hope, and this was a uh, high school, and they also had a church at the same time. So we went here. This is a Cuban, you just skip. This is a Cuban clinic now. This is where Dr. Lazat went. So you know better than me, so we were there for a little bit and like, you know how like a hospital is, it's usually clean, sanitary, has a lot of stuff in it, but there was, like, there was nothing, like anything in there. Like I didn't see any like material or any like anything to use to save anyone's life. I didn't even see bandages, didn't see. Why don't we talk a little bit about the poverty that you saw and then we're going to go into impacts and then I want to have the chance for people to ask questions. <laughs> Or anything that they have. So we talk a little bit about poverty. Um, so if you go back a couple of slides, there was a picture of a river, and this river is the basically the main water source in Haiti, other than be like Brit. So everyone used this river water to clean themselves, clean their animals, clean their um, clothes, to drink from, to use the bathroom in. Or the other option was traveling however many miles in the morning to go to Be Like Brit to get a jug of water because Be Like Brit was able to give away 10,000 gallons of water every day to the people of Haiti. Um, and um, one day we went on a hike up a mountain and like I think the most um, impactful part of that was that we kind of like learned that every single day people would go up and down that mountain to get like water and then going back up the mountain they would be carrying like gallons and gallons on their shoulders to bring back to their family so like it was hard to like even though we were sweating and like really hot and tired it was hard to complain about it because like we would like people would walk by us that were carrying like five gallon jugs on their shoulders and like barefooted and wouldn't complain so um it kind of like gives you a little more appreciation to like just walk to the bubbler in school according to the statistics 70% of all Haitians are, do not have work, have no income source at all. The average salary for a Haitian person who works daily is $1 a day. So it kind of brings perspective on, on, on what they have and compared to, compared to us. I mean, we can't even imagine living on $1 a day. But their economy is a little bit different. And as, as you heard from the, from the group here, they're very generous. And what they have, they give to you. Especially as people who come in to their culture and help you. But when you walk through the, the Port-au-Prince, and you walk through Grand Bois, or you drive through Port-au-Prince, you notice some people in some dire situations. The best thing I can say is we have poverty in the United States. This is poverty on steroids. This is absolutely amazing what people can live having absolutely nothing. Like Meg told us, our uh, person that was in the uh, instructor of us, basically, she was telling us how one time they built this house for someone and we get them food and supplies after how she came back and the people were giving out their food and supplies for other people even though we just gave them their food and supplies so they were so grateful that they started giving out the food to the community even though it was for them for them so that really struck me so at the end of the week when you build your house you give them a frame to put a mattress on so they don't have to sleep on the floor and you give them a goat and you give them some rice and you give them some some um, things to cook the rice and you give them some fruit and some chairs. And then what happened was um, Megan Foley forgot to give them something. So she went back two hours later to give them these other supplies. And when she got there, there was a whole group of people surrounding the house. And the woman who had just received all these supplies was giving out what she had to her neighbors already, saying, I want to contribute. I have so much, I want to give that to you. And again, of course, Megan Foley was thinking, why don't you save it? You know, have it for your family. But that wasn't what's on the woman's mind. But what the woman was saying, I've been so blessed and so generous, I'm going to extend that generosity 
and, and blessings to others. And a lot of that has to do with voodoo also, and the idea of karma. I am good to other people as other people would be good to me. So that kind of wraps around how they live their, live their, their world. About Dr. what Dr. Lazat was saying, um, average salary is like a dollar a day. School is $280. So if you think about that, if you have more than one kid, you're most likely only going to be able to send one to school. And that's why they take education so seriously and are making fun of Jason for not, for not go liking school and not wanting to go. Because if you say that to them, they're like, why? <coughs> education is a blessing there, and they just, when they get it, they're so happy. Why don't we uh, go around and just talk about the impact of the trip on your on your life, uh, of the way you're seeing it, and then we're going to open up for questions. So it, it really was impactful for me because I was never really understanding how like what poverty is like in a real like in a real way. It was like even in the United States, it's like bad, but like here it was insane. That, like they had nothing. You had to burn your trash. They don't understand how bad that is for you. They had no clothes, they had nothing, and then I sit here, I sit up here with jeans, LeBron shoes on, and a t-shirt, you know what I mean? So like, I'm just grateful for everything my mom, my parents give me, I'm grateful for this life I live. It's just insane, because like, it's just hard to see what people go through and then see your life. So I just want you guys to think about it like that. Even if you guys aren't doing good, just think, it could always be worse. So I think coming home was the hardest part because we just spent a week in Haiti and we were surrounded by all this poverty. Like if you picked up kids, then you could feel every single rib on their body and their spine. And it was sad, but knowing you could come home to like a warm shower, like clean water, you don't even have to think about drinking. Like you can get food. It was just the guilt of having that when you just left them there and they have nothing and there's nothing you can really do about it. I think that's what it'd be the hardest. I certainly agree with both of you, especially Jason, and that um, it really made me appreciate you know, all these photos and videos I've seen with people who die of poverty. Um, it really made me realize more and actually, you know, connecting with people, communicating with people, sharing jokes with people um, in Haiti is that they exist, and as we speak, they're speaking with their friends, they're walking miles for water, and, you know, they exist. I've seen them, and it's, it's really remarkable to know that they're suffering as I so, it's really um, I think the, <clears throat> what had the most impact on me was seeing these people that had nothing and like still got out of their way to talk to their neighbors and like make everyone feel loved and um, like they're just such happy people and um, I think that's something like that we miss like they're so, they're not worried about where they need to be or who they need to be with, they're just like enjoying the moment that they're in and the people they're with and they just like make the best of every situation. Um, even though like we would look at them and be like, wow, like you have it really hard. Like they would look at it and be like, actually like my neighbor has it worse. Like I need to be helping them or I need to be doing this or like they're always looking out for the people that they love and they like pretty much love everyone around them. So they're always like, they're just always looking out for each other and like they're a big family. And it's like a beautiful thing to see because the week we were there, like we were part of that family and they cared about us just as if like they had known us our whole lives. Okay, so one, on the last day we went to the beach, I, there was a guy there who tried taking my shoes. He was a grown man trying to take like this, some little girl's sneakers just because he didn't have any of his own. So, like Jason said, I'm just really thankful for like, all of the material things that they don't even have the things to survive and I have all these um, extra things that aren't necessary in life. And also, uh, they every day they wanted to spend time with their families because they had n really nothing else to do. But they also just re really appreciative of their families and friends. So just being able to spend time whenever I want instead of being locked in my room or whatever, um, it's just really like something that I really appreciate now and want to do more of. I think the biggest impact for me, like when you go there, you don't think you're going to make amazing connections with everyone. There's 66 kids, but the kids at the work site, um, it was really hard to leave. It was really hard to see, even. But I remember, like, the last day when I was leaving, like, every other day they were fine. They said their goodbyes. But, like, the last day, she was saying, like, no, come back, come back, like, take me. 
and that was just really hard. Probably the biggest impact for me was seeing everybody was so happy in such a terrible environment. And it showed me, to, no matter what I have, to always be happy and thankful for everything. And even if like, some things get kind of hard, to look at the bright side of everything and see what good can come out of it. Well, the most impactful thing for me was like, we would go to the work site and we would get cement all over us. And then we'd be complaining about how we need to take a shower, we're so dirty, but the people at the work site, they would be working much longer than us. They would barely take water breaks, and like they didn't have a shower to go home to. So yeah, when I came home and took like a three hour shower, I was kind of like, yeah. And um, you like, we can't like force any of like these lessons that we learned on you guys. It's just like, we're not trying to like rub anything in your face or anything like that. Like, we just like, like what we learned there is something like I know I'll carry for the rest of my life. And like, I think we hope that like, like from hearing the presentation and like if any of you get the opportunity to go, that like you can like just think about things differently and you think about them now. And it's like kind of hard for us to explain to you in words, like it's more of like a feeling when you're there. But um, I think like the main thing is just like to, just like be happy with what you have and like know how like truly blessed you are, like even if you think that you're not. Like so just like think about things from a different perspective. So right now we want to open up the floor for questions. So Dr. Lazat has a mic. Um, if you want to ask anyone anything about what you saw or what they said, feel free, just raise your hand and we'll try to answer it for you. Just a couple of words about Be Like Brit. If you looked at that compound, you saw a big open area that was a soccer field. Actually, the, the site of my accident. Below that soccer field actually is a 10,000 gallon cistern where water from the mountains flows into it. Water is a major, major problem in Haiti. Clean water is a major problem in Haiti. As you imagine, as we talked about the river, people use it to bathe. Well, everything comes down from the mountains into the river. So you can imagine how clean that water is in the river. But that's the only water they have. So Landon and Cheryl have really done a great job in trying to provide some resources to the people of that area. Be Like Brit is the largest employer in Grand Guap. In other words, they employ more people than anyone else. So they're having a, a strong impact. But of the most important things for them is trying to sustain a lifestyle for the 66 children. There's not much opportunity. So in some ways, they're being very innovative. They're being very creative in figuring out how they're going to be able to provide an economy and a, a sustain a lifestyle for their 66 children. I've got four children. I'm scared to death on what they're going to be doing when they grow up. Len and Cheryl have 66 that they're trying to figure it out. Plus their own, too. Ian, do you have a question? So I noticed in a couple of the pictures that there was uh, power lines. Did, was there any kind of electricity or power there? Like lights? Good question. Okay, so um, that's, good. that's a good question. And the answer is yes, there is electricity in some places. Um, not in most places. Like Grand Guad's a small town of maybe 3,000, 4,000. And very few people have the chance for electricity. Maybe in port au there's more of an opportunity to have electricity, because that's, that's a capital city, you know, and people live there. Um, the time that you know that is at, at night. So when we uh, we have reflections at night with a group on top of the, the orphanage, and we overlook the view, it's a beautiful view. But at night, when you look out there, you don't see hardly any lights. So the light, people who have access to power is very, very limited. Be Like Brit has solar panels, and they have a whole huge room just full of batteries that, that, that fund, uh, that, that, that power up their, their home. Their street lights are actually solar. So if you look, um, it's kind of ironic that they're in poverty, but all their street lights have solar panels on top to power the street lights, which I'm kind of jealous. I mean, I think we should do that. But um, there is some 
traditional power through other solar means, like be like Brick uses solar, but all those streetlights are solar as well. Also, just as a um, just as an aside with that, um, the the house that we are working with, the houses around it, did have electricity, and what they did um, was there was one pylon outside in the street, and people would actually get just tiny wires, you know, like the ones that you see inside your walls, twist them around, I don't know how they do it without getting shot, um, actually connect them to the pylon itself and just, just string it to their house, with wrapping it with cloth. It's, it's incredibly crude, it easily start a fire, and that's how they get power. It's, it's incredibly dangerous. Any other questions here? Comments. So. <laughs> well, um, as I'm stopping crying sitting here, um, I can't tell you how you've touched me today to see that our students from West Boylston got out of their comfort zone and did something so incredibly hard. Some people didn't talk to you today. Some of the kindest students I've ever had in my existence here at the school are sitting down and not saying a whole lot, but boy, they're kind people. And the fact that all of you um, took this upon yourself to get there, and now the death of, of Brittany Gengel at 19 years old, what her parents have done so much, you from our school are gonna bring this out because I know you're not done. I know you're not done. You said something about reading. Are you kidding me? We can't put together books to send down there? Are, we, are you kidding me? We, what we have and what we could do? I am so touched by your comments. And by the way, excellent speaking there today, those of you. You really touched my heart a whole lot. And I can't thank you enough for, for what you did. How has it not changed you forever? Forever. And then hopefully some of your colleagues and your friends here will be changed in some way. I am extremely touched. I couldn't be happier to have worn your Be Like Brit yellow. Thank you very much, Ms. Silva. Some applause for our uh, participants. Just a few words before uh, we go back to your classes. You guys, this is, this is all wrapped around, you know, our, our theme of leadership this year. And when I, when I mentioned earlier that we couldn't have done it without you, honestly, you can't do things like this without support of a community. I know I speak a lot, and I, I know I spoke a lot about Eric Grenchen, the, 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 the Navy SEAL who went through SEAL training and talked about how he got through it. <coughs> Remember the book that we read, uh, Warrior in the Heart, early in the last summer? Well, this has a lot to do with that. Our people, your, your friends who went to Haiti, they needed each other when they were down there. It wasn't easy at times. It was hot, and we were experiencing things in terms of poverty, in terms of cultural differences that were quite radical. But we also knew that you were here, and we knew that you supported us, and we thank you for that. If you have, you just don't need to go to Haiti for community service either. And that's an important message that I want to make. How you treat others, even in our own community, is very important. I know we, you know, I, I don't want to sound a little soft here, a little bit, a little too preachy. But the whole idea of respect, participation, responsibility, when we talk about who we are as people, flows not just through projects like this, but through our everyday events with each other. Helping each other out. Talking to people who may need friends. Making sure the hallways are clean. Participation in a positive way in your classrooms and also in the community. And I know a lot of you are involved in the community in different organizations. That's all part of the big picture. If you're fortunate enough to go to a project like this in a third world country or developing country, it's impactful. It kind of frames it. It kind of says you get back here and you say, I am fortunate. I have a lot to give. 
I have a lot to offer. And that's where you begin. You begin with offering it and helping and being a good person in the community that you're in. So thank you for your attention. One more applause for the people. Please come see me, Ms. Ms. Grosier, or anybody up here on the stage. And uh, they, they do trips about five, ten times to twenty times a year. Take care now. Have a good day.